Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits, I have updates on knitting projects, sewing projects, spinning, as well as some tentative plans for new projects that will be coming soon. So let's get started. This first tidbit is just a reminder that I will be the June program speaker for the Minnesota Knitters Guild this Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time. So anybody is welcome to see this. This will be a Zoom program. If you are not a member, you do have to register ahead of time. Uh, if you are a member of the guild, you'll automatically be sent a link. So I'll leave information down below to links where you can find out more about the program and how you can register if you would like to attend. This next tidbit is about doing research on historical topics that have to do with fashion history. So I subscribe to a channel. The person is Abby Cox. She is a fashion historian. I believe her expertise is in the 18th century. It might be the 17th century, but I believe it's the 18th century. So she often um, does essays on different uh, um, topics related to dress history. And people ha often ask her about her uh, research, what resources she uses to do her uh, research. And last week, her video was on exactly that topic, and I found it really interesting. Uh, several of the websites that she uses are ones that I use and, and know about, but there were a number of them that she talked about that I was unaware of and I think could be really interesting. And most of them, if not all of them, are free. There are many websites that, re that are behind a paywall or require you to be a member of, of a specific academic institution, but she was letting people know what resources were out there that would be available to anyone. So if you are interested in fashion history or knitting history or anything to do with, uh, with that sort of thing, uh, I am going to leave a link to that video because I thought it was so, so valuable. This next tidbit uh, comes from the Wool Channel newsletter. I talk about the Wool Channel just about every week. It is a website uh, started by Clara Parks very recently. She's an expert on uh, yarn and wool, and she started this website, and you can get a free newsletter once a week where she'll tell you what's going on uh, that week in wool news. And then if you subscribe um, it's with a paid subscription to the website, you can also join in the forums and communities and, and talk and interact with other people who are also members. But in this week's newsletter, she uh, left a link to an Instagram account that is run by a woman who is, uh, she shears sheep, but also llamas and alpacas. And rather than just watching her shear the entire thing and, and maybe commenting or answering questions while she's doing it, instead, she has a camera going while she's shearing and then later does a voiceover. So it's edited and it's very short, but it, she gives a lot of information about what she's doing and why she's doing it and, and the things that she might have to do that are specific to this particular animal, not even this particular breed, but this specific animal. Um, and I found it delightful and was so happy to have it. So I will leave that in the show notes below. This tidbit came to me from Lynn via a direct message on Ravelry, letting me know about an Eventbrite event uh, from the Shaker Museum. And it is called Fair Trade and Handmade Textiles. Join knit designer Hannah ha Hayworth, Haworth, I'm not sure which, and Tatter founder 
Jordana Monk Martin as they discuss their passion for handmade textiles and their commitment to protecting the people who do this important and painstaking work. Hear about the challenges and rewards of promoting handwoven textiles and products sourced from the United States and around the world in this online conversation. So the admission for this is pay what you want or pay what you can. Um, but I will leave links below for the tickets. And this is going to be on July 1st. Uh, I believe it's at 5.30 Central Time. I think it's at 6.30 Eastern Daylight Time here in the U.S. This next tidbit came to me in a comment on last week's video. I had uh, left a link last week to a mill that was having a virtual tour that I thought was particularly good. And someone left me a link to this one, which is a mill tour in a podcast called Fleece and Harmony. I think, I've, I think people have told me about this particular podcast before. So they are located, this is a mill, so they, they are actually a sheep farm, or they, at least they have a farm and they have sheep. And so they have a mini mill where they process their wool, but they also process the wool of other shepherds on Prince Edward Island. The equipment they use is from Belfast Mini Mills. So Belfast, Prince Edward Island, is where this establishment is located also. And so this is a mill tour where she goes through each station and she explains what the machinery does but she has the machinery off so that you can actually hear her because that's always a challenge when you, the, with these mill tours is that people are shouting or you can't quite hear what, what's going on. So this is a pr completely quiet. And what I thought was really interesting is that they use equipment from Belfast Mini Mills which is also there in Belfast. Um, and so they had the same equipment and they both produced semi-worsted yarn, but Belfast Mini Mills had set up their equipment to create um, two-ply yarn with a Z-twist, final Z-twist, which is less common. And then um, Fleece and Harmony have their setup to be more standardized, which is so that it ha is S-plied. So I think that's really interesting that they have the same kind of equipment, but they, they are doing a yarn set twist in the opposite direction, and they're in the same location. So I thought it was a really nice tour. She did a nice job explaining how things work. So I'll leave a link down below. This last tidbit is that it is state fair season. Now, every state in the United States uh, will schedule their state fair at different times. Here in Minnesota, our state fair is uh, at the end of August to beginning of September. It's the 12 days leading up to Labor Day, which is the final day of the fair. So, of course, the fair was canceled last year and they are planning on having it this year. And because Minnesota has really one of the largest state fairs in the country, uh, and we have a lot of knitters because we have a northern climate and the people who live here, are many of them are descended from um, immigrants that came from northern uh, Europe, like Scandinavia or Germany. Uh, we have a lot of knitters here, a lot of really good knitters. So our knitting competition is unparalleled to any other <laughs> state fair knitting competition. And this week they emailed out what's called the premium booklet for creative activities. So it explains to you what the rules are, what the categories are, and so that you can uh, register for participating in the competition. So I went through and I looked at all of the different creative activities uh, categories to see how many different ways you could enter knitting into the fair. So there is a category that's called hand knitting because there's also machine knitting and there's crochet. Uh, and uh, there are 49 categories that you can enter in hand knitting. And garments start with, uh, with children's sizes, so no infant sizes. So there's, so there's 49 categories within hand knitting, and then there's another 25 categories that are split up amongst other different um, creative activities, uh, such as um, 
garment making, the things like uh, an infant's hat or bonnet, a uh, little outfit, that kind of thing that are meant to fit an infant, those are in garment making, which would include sewing as well. But you would be competing against typically other knitting. Sometimes the category might include sewing and crochet once in a while, that like a bonnet could be any one of those things. Um, and then there's things like soft toys. There is a category for uh, uh, competitors who are senior citizens, so they're over 65. So there's a smaller subset of knitting uh, categories uh, competition just for that age group. But altogether, there's nearly 75 different knitting categories. So if you live in Minnesota, you might want to think about entering something that you've knit on the past couple of years into the fair. They give you just a very uh, small amount of comments, like a, a sentence or two, but it's meant to give you feedback on your knitting. So they're not going to give you an entire, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs of information, but they will give you sometimes a cryptic, but sometimes a really useful uh, comment on your knitting. I've always loved the fair and looking at the knitting, and I might actually, I haven't entered anything for a number of years, and I, I might enter something this year. I haven't quite decided yet. So every state fair is different and how they run their knitting competitions is different. Most states have just a few different categories of, of knitting in their competition, but your state should also have some sort of a premium booklet that explains the competition and, what, and how you enter and what, what the requirements are. So if you're curious about what the Minnesota State Fair knitting competition looks like, I will leave links to a couple of different videos I've done in the past uh, where I have filmed at the State Fair grounds once the competition results had been announced. So before we get started on all my various works in progress, I just wanted to say that last weekend, I was telling you guys about this last week, that I went to a very small fiber festival. It was like the first event I've been to in probably a year and a half. I went with my friend Celeste, who I haven't seen in a year. And so it was really, really great. We got to, to it was because it's more than an hour drive. We got to drive up there and talk and catch up. And then we parked and we were just getting ourselves unloaded. And I hear a voice that said, are you Roxanne? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, oh, I'm Sherry. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for your videos. So she had been laid up with a, a, a she's a spinner and a quilter. And she'd been laid up with a, a broken foot last summer when she couldn't spin and so she was knitting and so she'd been watching my all my videos for techniques or casual Fridays or whatever. It was just unexpected but it was really delightful to meet you. So hi Sherry and it was so great uh, to see you last weekend. So I am still plugging away at my vintage 1960s sweater. So I will, in a minute, I will um, switch to overhead and, and show you where I am and what kinds of things um, uh, have happened in this past week with that project. And then I will come back and uh, answer a couple of questions that came up in the comments. So just to, as a reminder for this sleeve, because I knew that I was gonna be probably short on yarn, and I wanted to make sure that the sleeve cap was worked as it was originally instructed. Um, which was in this direction. I used a provisional cast on, I used Judy's Magic cast on, um, to cast on the number of stitches that I needed to work the cap. Then I returned to the cast on, there were live stitches on there, and I uh, joined in the round, and then I worked the sleeve uh, down to this point. So I am currently at the point where if I wanted three quarter length sleeves, I would start the ribbing here. So I will have, I think, more yarn than I need to do that, but I'm not sure exactly how much more. So I am going to do the second sleeve uh, up to the same point, and then I will measure the yarn and I'll look at, you know, how, how much I have left and how much more stockinette I can knit before I need to switch to the ribbing. So I might end up with something um, down to here rather than something up here, which I would, I would much prefer something that length than this length. I would really prefer something down to here, but I, I don't think I'm going to get that. When I knit this button band, once I got it done and I was looking at where the buttons were supposed to be placed, I realized that I'd actually 
worked the button band maybe three rows shorter than it should have been before um, I started the shaping for the yoke up here. It just wasn't quite long enough. So what I did was I, I snipped a row out and captured the live stitches on each of these needles. So these are the base, the, these are the running threads basically between stitches. Um, and then these are the heads of the stitches. So I worked another three rows and I've got the working yarn at this end. And what I am going to do is then graft these two back together in pattern. So this is the, a similar situation that I was in when I did my 1890s sweater last fall where I had this big chunk of Knit One Pro One ribbing and I needed to remove a chunk of it and, and re-knit that particular set, um, section. I didn't want to remove everything that was above it. And I needed to graft it back in patterns. I have resources for how to do it. it it's, it's a little tricky. What most people are doing when they are grafting in pattern is that they have worked two separate pieces of fabric and both of them have been worked toward the join. So one has been worked in that direction and one has been worked in that direction. And when they are grafting in pattern, they end up with a half stitch offset because these things were worked in the opposite direction. That, that's fairly easy to graft that way. This is a different situation. This is a situation where this entire thing was knit in this direction. So this piece was knit toward the join and this piece was knit away from the join. So you can graft something like this in pattern and not have that jog. So it just isn't something that uh, I do regularly and it is done a little bit differently than the other situation where you've knit two pieces and you want to uh, graft them together. It's the kind of thing where it's only 12 stitches, it's not gonna take me very long, and I'm starting the graft at this edge so that the tail will be here and I can bury that tail in the seam line. Um, but it's at a very visible location, so if I screw up that edge and it just doesn't look very good, I'm not going to be very happy. Uh, if I have to, I can rip all of this back and then just re-knit from this point on. I don't want to do that, so I'm going to put up with, with this. But I would rather re-knit this than have a crappy looking graft right here. So the final thing is that I got buttons for my sweater. So I, when I bought this vintage kit, I bought two other kits at the same time. The other two kits were both a brand called Andrew Stewart and they both came with buttons that would match the garment. So the, this yarn did not come with, with matching buttons, so I needed to buy some. Uh, and I went to the fabric store where I usually go to buy buttons for my sweaters, whether they're vintage or not, because they have vintage buttons there. So really, I had found some buttons in their standard uh, button location. The, they, they have big tubes, plastic tubes, and I'd found two that I thought could work, and I was went to the counter to ask for an opinion because I always value uh, their opinions about buttons. And she said, well, have you looked at the, our vintage buttons? And I said, well, one of these vintage, one of these buttons is vintage. It was a pretty boring button, actually. She reached across the counter and then put this down in front of me. These are from the 1960s and I just love them. They, you know, they're, they're going to go really well with these. I have tiny little buttonholes. These are going to fit through. All I need is for the buttons to get through the hole once <laughs> um, because it's a V-neck and I can uh, put the sweater on and off by just pulling it on over my head. I was really delighted with these. I thought they were uh, so pretty and it was very handy to have uh, somebody just hand them to me <laughs> and have them be so perfect. I have one other new work in progress. It's a what I would call a plain vanilla a pair of socks, just uh, ribbing at the very top and then stocking it all the way using self-striping yarn. This is a Felici uh, fingering weight from Knit Picks. I've never used their sock yarn, but I love a self-striping sock yarn. And for some reason, I have a lot of socks that either have pink or purple or red in them and this has got all of that. 
Uh, so I just started it last night when we were doing Zoom social knitting, and um, I'm very happy to have a mindless sock project like this. I haven't had one for a long time, and it's the perfect kind of thing uh, for social knitting, so I don't have to really pay attention to what I'm going to do. So I, when I knit a plain vanilla sock, I use the technique that I describe in my tutorial that it's called August Sock Knit Along. I'll link, I'll link it down below. Um, basically, it's a way to really customize the fit of a sock by taking quite a few measurements and then identifying where you're going to have fit issues. Uh, oftentimes in the heel is going to be an issue or there might be a mismatch between your leg circumference and your foot circumference and so you need to adjust for that. So I have several different kinds of heels and then I explain how to modify those heels in order to fit the specific person and then also toes as well. So I haven't quite decided what kind of heel I'm going to use. I have been using what's called a plain heel for the past year or so, I've, I quite like that. It's the same as a peasant heel, only you don't, you don't mark the location of the heel and return to it later. Instead, as soon as I finish the leg, I'll be able to do that heel and then continue and do the foot. And uh, I really like that because it allows me uh, to just knit the foot in order as I would for any other sock. Um, and there's also a really great way of adjusting for fit because I have a very, high arch and long heel and so I need an adjustment for a heel like a short row heel or a peasant heel. I can't wear them without doing a modification. So I'll leave links to all of that uh, down in, in the description but I'm just so happy to just, it's just a plain old striped sock and it's making me so happy. So this 1960 sweater is knit with fingering weight yarn uh, which is, makes for a very lightweight sweater. And I mentioned last week that I really don't have much use for a lightweight sweater. I have a few of them, a couple of fingering weight sweaters, but I only am able to wear them like for a couple of weeks a year. And I have one three quarter length sleeve sweater, which is not one of the fingering weight ones. The most use I've gotten out of that sweater was when we were traveling and we were in San Francisco and we were outside most of the time and it was the spring and so it was handy to have that sweater to, um, to put on and take off throughout the day. So the question was can't you wear a lightweight sweater indoors and absolutely that would be when I was <laughs> I would be wearing it would be indoors. Uh, if I'm wearing a sweater outside I also have a coat on because in the winter, if I'm wearing a worsted weight sweater, which is almost all the time, I'm wearing that inside the house all the time. You'll see me wearing those on casual Fridays. And that's not just so I can show off my sweater. It's because I need a sweater. <laughs> so, and I'm wearing worsted weight sweaters indoors and, and even heavier weight ones sometimes as well. Uh, we do cer certainly heat our house. But when it's, you know, 20 below outside you, and you're sitting near a window, the cold seeps through those windows. And if you're just sitting, you are not using any energy and you get cold. So when I'm wearing a fingering weight sweater, it's because it's spring and I don't need a worsted weight sweater when I'm inside. So anytime I go outside and I have a sweater on, I probably have a coat on or a jacket on over the top of that sweater. So that's why they're not really that useful to me. We just don't have much of a spring here. We have winter, which is very long, and then we have April. That is uh, the transition from winter to spring. It's horrible, it's gray. Um, the snow is ugly and melting and once it's melted, there's nothing but um, There's nothing green and there's no leaves on the trees until end of April beginning of May and and May is really Spring for us and then we have summer fall is a little bit longer maybe six weeks But we we don't really have spring here. It's just it's not really a season <laughs> that that we enjoy here We have beautiful summers but our springs are nothing, um, nothing much, and that's why I don't have much use for lightweight sweaters. The second question I had was, what yarn am I using to seam this vintage sweater? Normally, I would just use my project yarn to seam, but I'm already going to be running out, uh, and, I'm, and I didn't want to use any of my project yarn to seam the sweater. So what I'm using 
is this is a, a it's been in my stash for years it's knit picks palette it's a fingering weight it's a two ply fingering weight wool yarn it might be, even be considered light fingering um, but it's very close in color to the actual sweater it's slightly darker which if you sew and you have a choice between something lighter or something darker you go with something darker because it's more likely to hide and also because of the way I'm seaming using mattress stitch very unlikely to see any of the yarn uh, in the seam lines at all so that's what I'm using to seam the sweater you can usually get away with a different fiber as long as the washing instructions are the same for example, if you had a cotton sweater that was machine washable and you were gonna put it in a warm dryer, you wouldn't wanna use a, a yarn like this, even if it matched, that was wool, because when you put it in the wash and the dryer, the wool would felt and shrink and it would change the seams. So you try to keep things that, that uh, have the same washing instructions or can tolerate conditions that are worse than what the sweater so you could use something that that could be machine washable in a sweater that isn't machine washable that could work um, perfectly fine the fabric store that I went to this week is one that I always go to when I'm looking for buttons for um, my sweaters and it's because they have vintage buttons there. There is a Minnesota Button Society and the members there collect buttons and trade them and sell them. And there's a member of the Button Society who sells her buttons there on consignment. And that's, uh, and I love vintage buttons. I just, even if the, the sweater isn't a vintage sweater, that the buttons are so interesting. I always go there. This fabric store is very different from the other fabric stores that I have gone to, like Joann's, which is a big box fabric and craft store. You can take fabric to the cutting counter and they will cut it for you, but there's no staff on the floor that are there to help you find fabrics and help you make decisions about things like that. You're really on your own at Joann's. SR Harris Fabric, which is that outlet that I've been to a couple of times, it's overwhelming. There's even fewer staff there, so they, they can tell you what part of the store you might find something, but there, there really isn't anybody there to help you uh, help answer questions about fabrics. But Treadle Yard Goods, which is in St. Paul and where I bought the vintage buttons, is different. It's like an old-fashioned fabric store. So when I was in there uh, asking about buttons, I had brought the wool fabric the hand woven wool fabric that goes with the, the yarn for this vintage um, sweater because I'm going to make a skirt. And I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. Uh, I'm planning on lining this. I wanted to ask, what do I line this with? Uh, and I also wanted to know, I said, I need some practice um, pattern matching. Uh, and because I've never done that before and I want to do that with some fabric before I do this and so I was talking to one woman at the counter and then one of the other salespeople just went off somewhere in the store and came back with two different fabrics with plaids and uh, one of them was this it's just flannel but it's a plaid flannel that's a uh, pretty similar in terms of the size and the symmetry of the squares that need to be pattern matched and you know they were they were giving me tips about that, and they were um, talking to me about invisible zippers and that I've been practicing, and it was just such a so nice to be able um, to actually ask questions. And they also offer classes, so I, I'm uh, thinking this summer I might be taking some classes from them um, as well because just being able to ask questions and get some answers and get opinions and, and be able to learn something um, directly rather than having to try to search and search is going to be fantastic. Otherwise, I haven't sewn anything yet this week. I did uh, manage to give away my grandmother's sewing machine to um, a college student. She's the daughter of somebody in my Wednesday knitting group who, and she just learned to sew a few months ago and the machine she's using is really made for quilting. And um, this young woman is sewing different kinds of things, but some of what she's sewing is knits and she was really struggling with that machine 
um, to make it work with uh, stretch fabrics and my grandmother's machine absolutely has a number of stitch patterns that work well with stretch fabric. So I took it over there. I spent a couple of hours uh, walking you through how it all works and, and, and different things. And um, so that was really great. I'm so happy it's gone to a home of somebody who um, is going to be able to use it and appreciate it. I was telling you a couple of weeks ago about this breed study kit that I bought off Etsy that has 30 different uh, wool breeds in it. It's all combed top from 30 different breeds, so one ounce of each. I thought that would be a great way for me to really learn more about spinning and different wool breeds and in sort of small amounts. And then I can spin those up and then I can knit them into squares and, and then I can make a blanket out of out of those things. My plan is that I will get some labels that I can uh, write on with like fabric marker and then sew the labels on the back of each of those uh, swatches in order to keep a uh, note of, of which breed each one was. I thought about getting iron-on labels and then, I, and then I was reading some of the instructions for that online and even with, I have a wool pressing cloth even, but you know you have to keep the heat on for long enough that I was concerned about killing the wool and I didn't want to do that. So I'm going to get uh, sew on labels for those instead. But in the meantime, I haven't done any spinning in probably well over a year. It could be not since 2019. I don't know that I did any in 2020. I was just getting ready to start doing it again because I was planning on going to a a spinning conference, Ply Away, and that got canceled. And I just was like, oh well. And I, and I in the pandemic and whatever, I didn't, I didn't spin. I'm a fairly novice spinner to begin with. I'm not great. So what I did this week was I pulled out some combed top that I have in my stash. I don't remember what kind it is <laughs> at all. I have no memory of what it is. I just, I thought I'm not going to try to do anything specific. I just have to remember how to use my spinning wheel. Do I remember how to put it together? <laughs> put it together and do I remember how to get started? Do I remember how to do any kind of spinning? And, and just don't try too hard, just do it. And I wanted to see how long it would take me to spin one ounce of comb top because I had no idea. And so the first day, I think I got a tenth of an ounce done in 15 minutes. I set a timer for 15 minutes. I know from past experience that when something is new to me, I know I'm not going to be very good at it, that if I set a timer for 15 minutes, then force myself to do it for 15 minutes, but that also is a signal for me to stop. If I do that, each time for the first few days at least until I get back into it and then I can then it's more fun and then I know what I'm doing and I don't kind of like fall apart that works best for me because what happens is you might feel like oh I'm doing really great at this you know it's been 15 minutes but I'm having fun I'm going to keep going and then pretty soon it falls apart because you just don't have that muscle memory and even though you might not feel fatigued your muscles aren't used to that so I like using the timer method I thought this is going to take me forever to do an ounce but maybe not because maybe I'll get better and it, I did I got a lot better I spun up an ounce onto a bobbin and then I had to figure out how am I going to ply this and I didn't want to try to divide it and then do two ply so I did what's called a chain ply. It's like you have, uh, it's like you're doing a gigantic slip knot, like for crochet. So you have, you know, a loop that's formed from that big crochet, you know, slip knot. And then you reach through the actual working yarn and um, to get like a third strand. So you have this huge crochet loop and you twist it. So it's, it's like creating a three ply, but you only have one strand of yarn to work with. There's advantages and disadvantages. I chose to just think about the advantages. <laughs> and then the next step was taking it off the bobbin um, to wind it up so that I could create um, you know, a big skein that I could then wash because at the end you, you need to soak it and do whatever to finish the yarn and set the, pl set the, the ply. 
So I have this thing called a nitty knotty. So these are like perpendicular to each other. So you're going um, up and down and then up and down again so that you, you make this complete circuit. And because this is 17 inches from here to here and going around the end is an inch, so this ends up being two yards. The complete circuit is two yards. Because then what you can do is count how many strands you have, and that tells you how many yards. And the next thing you have to do is finish the yarn, and then I will knit up a sample swatch and see what this whole process looks like. I don't know if I'll do some more practice before I start on the wool breed um, study or not. I, I definitely am going to use this uh, fleece and fiber source book uh, when I can to help guide me. I don't know if every one of those breeds are in there. Somebody had mentioned to me they didn't think every single one of them was in here. And that, that could be true. I don't, I don't know. I haven't looked through it all yet. I'm thinking I can probably do, you know, one, maybe I can do one per week or one every other week in addition to doing, you know, some sewing. I'm just trying to get everything uh, juggling and manageable uh, to do at the same time. So I have this long-term project of knitting a sweater from each decade of the 20th century. And so far I've done 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, 20s, 30s, and I'm just finishing up 60s. So I have remaining 40s, 50s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Well, I learned to knit in the 80s. So the 1990s, and, and the purpose of this project is for me to really look and see how techniques and sweater constructions evolved through the 20th century. I'm very familiar with what was going on in the 80s and 90s. Like that is, I'm not going to learn something new uh, by knitting one of those sweaters. And I have several 1990s sweaters that I knit for myself that I actually still wear. Uh, and so the 1990s one is covered. The 80s is trickier because uh, several of my first sweaters either got ruined from the way I washed them or I gave them away, like I was living overseas when I learned to knit, came back for a year and then went overseas again. And so when I went overseas the second time, I gave one of the first sweaters I knit to a friend of mine who had really liked it. I actually uh, just uh, messaged him yesterday and said, I don't suppose you still have that sweater? Because I was what I was thinking that it would be interesting to re-knit a sweater that I did knit in the 80s, which I don't have any of those. Um, and it was a sweater that I quite liked. And I thought, well, I wouldn't mind re-knitting it, but it would be interesting to compare it to the original if by any chance he still had it, which was like 35 years ago. I wasn't expecting it. I said, I'm not expecting that you have it, but if you do, I'd be really interested in seeing it. And he's like, uh, no, <laughs> I, I don't have that anymore. So I still have the pattern. And it was in this book that was the first book that I bought when I learned to knit. Uh, I bought the pattern and the yarn and everything to knit my first project, which was a sleeveless v-neck top. And then I had to wait until I got paid the next week before I could buy a book on knitting. And this is the book I got. It came with um, this kind of reference book here, right here, it has, you know, how to do all kinds of things. And then it also came with a whole bunch of patterns, like of just a bunch of them, like for any, everything from little kids um, to adults. So to me, that seemed like a really good deal. And I, I did make several of these sweaters, um, only a couple of them. But the one that I um, made that I particularly remember was um, this one right here. And so I was rereading it yesterday to see what size it was, because it was the 80s, so everything was oversized. So this had two sizes. One of them was to fit, so it was uh, to fit 36 to 38 inch chest was the one size, and then the other one was like 40 to 42. So I bought this in Ireland, so it was in centimeters, 91 to 97 centimeters for the smaller size, and 102 to 107 for the larger. Now that's the to fit size. The actual size, finished size, uh, was 106 centimeters for the small. So like four to six inches of ease, depending on where you fell into the size range. And the other, that larger one was 121 centimeters. So if I were to make this again, I this was made with Aran weight uh, yarn, I would probably uh, size it down a bit to fit me better uh, with worsted weight yarn. 
but uh, I still like this pattern and I would, I, would, uh, I would wear this. So I'm thinking about doing that for the 80s. For the 1970s, my plan is to use, to design my own sweater using Elizabeth Zimmerman's EPS, Elizabeth's Percentage System, um, to, to create the sweater that I wanted. She wrote her books in the 1970s. And then the stitch patterns would come from Barbara Walker's uh, Treasury, Stitch, stitch Dictionary. So I would uh, choose the stitches uh, from there. And those were also published in the 70s. So that's my thought for the 1970s, and which that leaves the 1940s and 1950s. I had thought that because I skipped ahead to the 1960s, oh well, I'll go to the 1940s next. But after knitting this fingering weight sweater for <laughs> what seems like forever, I don't think that the next sweater I knit can be another uh, fingering weight or light fingering weight sweater. I think I need uh, something um, a little bigger, which is one reason I'm looking at uh, knitting uh, a sweater I was uh, reverse engineering last fall but didn't really get started on. So I might do that um, next and then do a vintage sweater. But I, I don't know if I'll do the 1940s next. Uh, the 1950s, uh, I'm thinking about doing a sweater. That was when they started a uh, publishing them in multiple sizes and they started doing this thing where they have a pattern where it's in all these different sizes and you can use any yarn weight and so I'm thinking I might do something like that I haven't picked out the pattern yet for that but but that lends itself to uh, knitting something at a little bit heavier gauge than fingering weight so I'm not sure quite yet what the order of things are going to be but that's what I'm thinking so far The sweater that I am reverse engineering is a commercially knit cashmere sweater. It's an air and weight uh, sweater and it has these kind of interesting cables that are that are sort of like traveling cables but but not quite. Um, so it's an interesting cable. It's got all the features I love like it's got pockets, uh, it's a cardigan, it, it, it's a nice long length, it's ideal for a Minnesota winter and I love it. Uh, the problem is um, that I, I have uh, uh, an elbow where I am always leaning it on my uh, office chair uh, when I knit and when I'm doing anything. And so eventually things uh, kind of break through. So this is you know too big a hole to try to fix. I really am not in that interested in fixing it. I'm not interested in ripping this out and re-knitting it. Uh, I went through all that last fall. A lot of people would want to do that. They would want to rip it all out and reuse it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's just I was more interested in figuring out how it all went together and looking at all the different stitch patterns and figuring out uh, how to re-knit it and maybe making some tweaks in at, at things where from a design perspective I would prefer them to be slightly different. Uh, so one of the interesting things about this button band, for example, is that this is not ribbing, this is brioche, which I, which I thought was interesting. Um, I really like these pockets, but I don't care much for how the cable kind of comes around the outside of it like that. Um, uh, not a fan of that. Um, and then at the top, you know, this is a very common thing to do in commercial sweaters where once you don't have enough stitches to continue um, the cable crossing, you just stop and work it in stock in it. So I've been uh, looking at how can um, I do that differently, but of course there's a challenge which is that all of the cables in the original sweater were all crossed to the right. And it seems fairly simple. Oh, we'll just mirror them over here. But all of the cables are crossed in that direction for both sleeves as well as the back. So there's, there's an odd number of cables on the back. There's not really a good way of crossing some of these and mirroring some of them. Uh, I could make all of them in one direction on the back and mirror them on the front. I could do some mirroring on the sleeves. There's, there's all kinds of things uh, that I can do. I haven't completely figured that out, but this is certainly something that I've been wanting to do. So in addition, I was looking for a project where I could use this yarn that I had dyed at a retreat and using as much of it as possible. I didn't want to make a pair of mittens. I didn't want to make a hat. I wanted to use it in a sweater in some way. 
and use as much of it as possible. And so one of my original idea was that I would incorporate this yarn in some way into the re, the reconstruction or a reverse engineering of this sweater. And I was I was trying out a few different things using some other gray and red yarn in my stash. And I wanted to do some different things with the pocket to make it look better. I came up with um, a pocket that was red on the inside and then had this I-cord across the top as an accent and still hadn't quite figured out how I was gonna incorporate the rest of the yarn in the sweater because I didn't think two pockets um, would use it all. Well, I really liked this particular gray and red color combination, but I hadn't swatched with the yarns that I actually had on hand that I intended to use for the sweater. So this, these are the yarns that I swatched with, but these are the yarns that I actually have. So this one's a little bit darker gray and it's more of a heathered gray. And then this yarn is not as dark and it's, it's tonal. It's, there are some parts of it, I don't know how well the camera's picking up. Sometimes reds don't, don't get uh, picked up very well. There's some parts that are almost like, what I, they're not really pink, but they're a light red. So technically, I guess they're pink. I wasn't completely happy with this color, and but I did a swatch with the two yarns that I have. Uh, and uh, I have to say, uh, I'm not really a fan of this. Uh, it's not terrible, but it's just not what I wanted. So I'm rethinking what yarn I would use with this gray. I do have a different, a solid color, darker red in my stash. And that would be something I would be completely happy with using only for the pockets. And then that would be the only um, color accent. I wouldn't try to incorporate the red anywhere else in the cables or ribbing or anything. And I could be quite happy with that, with these two together. Um, that still leaves me with this yarn and what to do with it. Um, and But one thing is because I'm not completely happy with this color, uh, I was thinking I could over dye it. I bought this kit um, from Clemis and Clemis. Uh, they, they make um, supplies for spinners, but this is a dye kit from Judith McKenzie. And she's got a whole booklet with different recipes for different, different ways you can color things. So my thought is that I'm going to over dye this and worry about how to use this in some other project, that I'm not going to try to use it in this reverse engineered sweater. I've, um, I've just given up on that. I thought at first it was a moment of genius when I realized I could combine the two projects and I just don't think it's going to work. So this is a, a, a different solution that could uh, end up working out really well for me. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.